During these 10 years, we have seen many different technologies erasing and promising to be the next big disruption from IoT to wearable devices, big data, gamification, virtual reality, augmented reality, just to mention some. But the fact is that indeed, they were not anywhere close to that massive disruption that triggered the digital transformation that was the smartphone. So my name is Martin Migoya, and I dedicate every day at Globant with my co-workers, with my Globers, to help unlock the value out of these massive new digital transformations and new technology transformations. Now, the history shows us that it's very different. Understanding, and there's a big gap, understanding where's the next big technological disruption and be able to take advantage of that. So imagine you are at the beginning of the 20th century. The automotive revolution was happening and it was blooming at that time. So it was pretty obvious to all of us, well, not us, but them, that investing on car manufacturing companies was a must. Well, it proved to be wrong. More than 1,700 companies were created during those days and those years, and only three survived after many government bailouts. The same happened on the railway side at the beginning of the 1800s. 4,700 companies does not exist anymore from those days, and 500 airlines does not fly anymore. And the pattern was pretty much the same, a big technological disruption followed by a huge rush on investment and that yields to negative return on capital. Today we have more than 3,500 AI companies and startups around the planet. I'm not suggesting the pattern will be similar, maybe it will be faster. Each of them have their own AI approach, their own uh, platforms. Each of them is having their own approach to how to solve different kinds of intelligence. But let me tell you, many of them will be dead in the next 18 months. So the question is not about if we need to invest or not on artificial intelligence, but the question is how. So at the same time of those massive technological disruptions happening, there were many industries that flourish. Like for example, the plane manufacturers, the role builders, even the insurance companies, and the real estate developers that are taking advantage of those huge transformations that were happening on the planet to develop their own businesses. So again, the question is not about if we need to invest, but how we need to do, we need to do it. AI is not new. It's not a new concept. It was born back in 1956 when some of the brightest minds on the computer science space got together at Dartmouth College on the summer of 1956 to talk about this. And they established the first ideas, the founded, their founding fathers of the idea of creating a human brain which is uh, done by computers. These guys totally underestimated the power and processing power that was needed to be able to create one of those. So the idea very soon fall into a very large winter, a very large winter, that lasts until the year approximately 2010, when some processing power started to be available to start processing some of the machine learning algorithms, and then the race of the uh, machine learning start to happen. And it was not until a couple of years ago that processing power and data access was so easy and so cheap 
that machine learning really uh, took off. So this supposes like a new paradigm on how you know we are creating these intelligences. The traditional paradigm or programming pra paradigm is that you first put, put data on the computer, then you write a program, and then after that program, you get the outputs as an outcome of running that program. Well, at machine learning, the algorithm is totally different. Now, just to give you an example, just check your iPhone. Go to your photos or your, or your or, uh, Android uh, phone. Go to your photos. Just type the search box and type the word dogs. And then suddenly, all the dogs you have on your library will appear. No human tag them. But a computer that has been trained to understand which are dogs and which are not dogs, tagged it automatically. So that's the new paradigm about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, the main concept is that we need to understand that machines learn. Machines can be trained. Machines can be taught. And not just that, but they keep on learning, and they keep on improving and getting better. So this is the new paradigm on how machines work. You have, no, go back, please. You have data, which are hundreds of pictures of, of uh, dogs that are being shown to a, an algorithm, to a computer. And then you have the output that is, yes, these photos belong to dogs. And then the computer will create a dog recognition algorithm. So that's the way that artificial intelligence, uh, that artificial intelligence work. So intelligence is not a one dimension. It's not a sing it has not a single dimension. Intelligence, as we know, has many different dimensions. So as humans, we have different intelligence dimensions. So we believe that creating AI is creating different types of technology. So as Kevin Kelly mentioned on his latest book about artificial intelligence and many other disruptions that are happening, there are animals that are much better than humans on certain things. For example, squirrels can remember the position of thousands of acorns for years. And that single feature outsmart humans by far. So in that aspect, animals are better than humans, being each of those globes a dimension of intelligence. But of course, as we all know, humans outsmart squirrels in many other dimensions. We have emotional intelligence, visual intelligence, verbal, social, many others, in which we perform quite well. But in that particular, we don't. On the other hand, also, machines have been outperforming human in many aspects. You know, an artificial mind, like a calculator you have in your pocket, has been outperforming us, outperforming us on math for many, many years. And Google is outperforming us on memory for many, many years. So what I'm trying to say with this, what I'm trying to say is that the intelligence is co composed by many, different, by many different dimensions. And even in the nature, there's not a single signal that shows us that one mind can excel at every single dimension of intelligence. So, we keep on insisting about the idea of creating a brutal, uh, a brutal artificial intelligence machine that can outperform everything in every single aspect. And that's even against the laws of engineering, in which you have trade-offs. If you make a Ferrari to run very fast, then it will not be very comfortable. If you make a very comfortable car, maybe it's not 
you know, that fast. Those are the trade-offs that we have in engineering and that happens in pretty much every aspect in the world. So we can say that where humans are good at, artificial intelligence is not, and likewise. So I'm, you know, committed to say that the future does not look like Terminator or Skynet. Not even like the New Yorker stated a few days ago, like this you know, beautiful illustration. But artificial intelligence look more, looks more like a human aid, like something that allows us to become smarter. So when everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, we love to say that we are living a moment of a revolution of augmented intelligence. We are saying that artificial intelligence is becoming more human by augmenting our capabilities of thinking. So how to take advantage of this? Well, you know, there has been many companies out there, as I, as I have said, uh, many companies out there that has been, in, in essence, providing solutions and creating platforms that pretend to be a one-stop shop for pretty much all the kinds of intelligence. Many, of, many times, many times uh, named as persons, you know, I don't know why. Um, but these platforms, you know, are bested on one single vendor, and we believe that to create the best possible solution on augmented intelligence, you need to be able to tap into those many different spaces to get the best possible algorithms, the latest, the latest ways of neural networks, the best processing power, and for that you need to be free. And you need to be able to select from that whole universe and a very vibrant community of developers and researchers are constantly understanding new ways of creating dimensions of intelligence. So let me give you some examples. And these examples are connected to the idea that artificial intelligence is invading pretty much everything. And is much closer to all of us than what we think. So a big online uh, education company came to us with the idea that they have been recording for the last five years the chats between the students and the professors. They had 170 million records of chats between the two of them. So we put it together a machine learning algorithm that created a bot, like you are seeing here on the screen, that answers those questions and that learn from those chats for the last five years. So now the machine is being able to answer almost 80% of the questions that the students are asking. And it's releasing time for the professors to tackle those problems and questions which are harder. So that's giving us the opportunity to have a better education on that specific area. And that for us is not pure artificial intelligence. It's an augmented intelligence tool for those teachers and professors to be more efficient. Let me tell you another example. We are obsessed at Globan with talent. Obsessed. And our idea is always to be able to detect who are our most valuable players. And indeed, we know who they are. We know who within Globan are the most valuable players and those guys that are top-notch in our organization. But we don't know it before. We can guess before, but we don't know it. So what we are projecting is a, an idea of you know, making a big questionnaire with many questions in many multiple dimensions, and then expose those questions in many multiple dimensions to all our Globers for them to be able 
to have like an RX, uh, like, a, like a photography, like a understand, deep understanding of who's who, and then tell to the machine who are those most valuable players. And the idea is that we will expose candidates to that questionnaire in multiple dimensions, and then the machine will give us the likelihood of that candidate becoming or not a most valuable player. I say that this is an augmented intelligence tool for our recruiters to unhide talent. We have many other examples. One of them will be here today. Some French entrepreneurs, maybe I hear, uh, we have Pierre here today. Thank you for coming, Pierre. Um, has decided that they will train a machine with all the my, uh, master music pieces from the great classical artists to create a machine that can compose some music. I won't break your speech anymore. I will keep on going. So there's a machine that has been recognized for the first time as composer by the International Academy of Composers, but it's not a composer, it's a machine. About six months ago, I was having a chat with one of the, with, with the president of one of the most important countries in Latin America. And he was transmitting to me his concern around how complex was the situation at customs of that country. Indeed, about 30% of the containers going in and out of the country were deconsolidated to understand if what they were exporting or importing was what was declared on the papers. The international benchmark of that 30% is 6%. So I immediately say, OK, the other 24 is not very fair. What's happening there is not very fair. We, I don't want to call it corruption, right? But it's not very fair. So we propose to the president, say, listen, we will get together information from the local IRS, from the local customs, and many other sources of information to understand which is the likelihood of a container of being bad? Because we know how these guys have been performing and have been behaving during the last years. And we know if, we have, if you have been importing or exporting the same merchandise for the last 20 years, you don't deserve to get a red, maybe. So which is the likelihood of getting a red channel or red getting a green channel? And we're implementing that. So I call that artificial intelligence not augmented intelligence for the government to be smarter, to be more efficient, but mainly to combat corruption and crime. So as you may see, we have artificial intelligence and augmented intelligence pretty much everywhere. In the education, on the government, on the uh, music, and even on the talent discovery uh, side. So <clears throat> to close, um, implications of AI are not minor. And we all know that there has been a huge discussion happening around these things. On one side, you have the World Economic Forum saying that Five million jobs will be destroyed in the next, uh, uh, by 2020, by, by AI. And people like Elon Musk painting like very weird scenarios of machines taking control over humans. And even people thinking about the need of a whole ban on artificial intelligence. On the other side, you have people like Mark Zuckerberg thinking that there's these tools will enable a better humanity, a place in which we all be better by the aid of augmented intelligence. It doesn't matter on which side are each of you. I personally have mine. But it doesn't matter on which side each of you are. But the truth is that the next big dis uh, discussion playground will be this, will be around this. So the question is not about if we need to invest or not on artificial intelligence,
but how the value will be unlocked. And it's very probable that the value will not be unlocked, as the history shows, will not be unlocked out of AI itself, but it will be unlocked out of those companies and, of course, industries that are able to use these amazing new technologies to operate faster, to operate more efficiently, to connect better with their consumers, to connect better with their employees and stakeholders. With these new tools, we can dream about having a world in which we anticipate behaviors. We can dream about having a world in where we create new experiences that didn't exist before, a world with less friction, a world that, in which illnesses are diagnosed much better than before, a world where we can hide talent, and a world where intelligent machines can help us fight corruption and crime. So, welcome to Converge, a place in which we will try to discover and work together to unlock the value of this new massive technology revolution. To have a better world, to have a better place, a better planet. Because at the end of the day, we are the owners of that revolution. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, for everybody, for coming. I'm extremely thrilled about the things that we have to present today. Um, what I wanted to do with my chat was, was just to illustrate like, a, a more human face of uh, all the things that we are listening about artificial intelligence. I like to say that you know, artificial intelligence is like a tsunami a transformational tsunami that is going on top of another transformational tsunami, which is a digital transformation. So we have two tsunamis, two transformation tsunamis coming at the, at the same time. And this is very unique for the times of, that we are living with, with technology. At Globan, we take this very seriously. And uh, we have a mandate that now, you know, every Glover, every Glover, 100% of our Glovers needs to understand the rudimentaries of artificial intelligence. So the whole the whole company is migrating, uh, migrating into that. Uh, but I'd like to introduce some you know, important speakers uh, that we have prepared for today. Um, as you know, at Globum, we are organized in different studios, which are deep pockets of expertise focused on specific trends and technologies. To, more, to dive more into AI, I'd like to share with you the work of our AI studio to learn how it can help organizations deliver a better experience to their user, users. So let me welcome to Barry Pelas, our studio partner of the AI studio. So Barry, thank you very much. Hey everyone. All right. So there are three main aspects um, to AI that really drive the core of what we're trying to, to accomplish with it. Those three aspects are improved decision making, enhancing the way that we consume and process data, and enabling extreme personalization through the context of the technology and the way that we interact with it. Globin's AI Studio bridges the gap between the business and the technology leadership, all the while trying to focus on the users and the design of the system. We provide a deep te technical expertise that when combined with the client's expertise can help achieve business outcomes. We work with you to envision what types of problems you could solve using artificial intelligence or intelligent systems. And we're constantly focused on the users, interacting with our systems, the context in which they're doing so, and how they're consuming the information that we're providing them. So let's take a look at the first one. The first core aspect is decision making. With humans being more connected than ever, our attention span, our cognitive stamina, if you will, um, is a resource that's becoming more and more scarce. We're using it with every decision that we make. And solving business outcomes is a, is a major consumer of those resources. So whenever we solve uh, a problem for a user, 
or an interaction pattern that is new or we come up with a new way to interact with these systems, we're making decisions. Intelligent systems can help us determine what types of uh, data that we're utilizing, where we're making the mistakes with that, with our decision making process, and also what is the human cost that goes along with making those decisions so that we can reduce it in the future. Examples of this would be cross-selling recommendation engines or a predictive behavior engine that allows you to predict what a user is going to do in a user interface or an interna interaction with their technology. The second one is information processing. A key aspect as to why AI has risen to the prominence that it has is its ability to process dark data. And what is dark data? Well, dark data is any kind of data that a, that a computer may have a difficult time parsing or utilizing for some need. And we've been able to break down that barrier in the past few years where computers are now able to look at an image and pull information out of it, determine what type of intentions are happening within an audio file, and even determine what we're talking about whenever we're using natural language between two humans. These systems are so advanced that they can even take a picture and they can parse it into a, a set of relationship matrices that allow us to identify the keywords associated with that picture, identify the categories that that picture belongs to. Ultimately, this is what drives things like Google image search related searches. And also, it can determine the types of audio within an audio file uh, in natural language and even the intention behind it. This means that all data is now accessible to us that it wasn't in the past, regardless of where it comes from or its medium. Unfortunately, with such a massive influx of data, we now have to weed through the noise. There's a lot of, of data that we can't really use, and AI can, can help with that problem. AI can show us what type of data to focus on, what information is missing, and also we can view data from different angles that we may not have considered before. Examples of this are computer vision, such as Face ID or Snapchat filters. In Adia, this is um, Alexa or Google Home or Siri. Um, but it can even be unstructured data, something like parsing the log files that you've been collecting for two decades that you thought were basically throwaway have now become one of the most important influxes of data in an artificial intelligence system. And the final one here is uh, contextual customization. Contextual customization is having an experience without even knowing that you wanted it based on where you are, how you're feeling, what you're doing. I may not want to hear the same type of music whenever I'm sad or I'm happy or I'm tired. People are not fixed points, and we don't want our interactions with technology to be fixed either. We want it to grow with us, to understand us. And AI systems can do that by not only adapting and reacting to what we do, but it can also detect and learn what makes an individual an individual. Extreme personalization. Examples of this would be as simple as changing the driving directions based on inclement weather whenever I'm coming into um, an upcoming weather event. Or if I like pizza during halftime and my favorite NFL uh, football team, then 10 minutes before uh, before the game, it, I can get a reminder that says, hey, go ahead and order that pizza because I know that you like it and I know how you like it, and if you order it now, it'll be ready for half time for you guys to have. So the last question for me here is, why does it hurt? And this stems from the idea that we constantly get the same question on, what can AI do for me? What types of problems can AI solve? And instead, our approach in the AI studio is to help you answer that question for yourself by determining what the problems are within your business that really keep you up at night. What are you trying to solve? What are you trying to make better? What, how can you optimize the way your teams are interacting with one another? When you identify the types of problems you want to solve, ask yourself, do we have the appropriate information to solve this? How complex is the problem that we're trying to solve? And ultimately, going back to the human capital, the cognitive stamina, are we simply putting too much time into this? This is just too complicated for us. We're wasting tons of time, energy, and money. It isn't about finding use cases for AI, but rather, 
what aspects about your business can be improved by intelligent machines. You need the right software, the right partners, and the right trusted advisors to be able to identify a problem and give you a solution. And that is why we created the AI Studio. Thank you. OK. So now I'd like to focus on how organizations can use AI to put their customers in the center and conceive seamless experience to simplify their lives. So Chris Avril, Globans Managing Director for EMEA, who also leads our consulting studio, and he will share with us how companies should look, the, should look for the brand voice to design and create unique user, user experiences. So Chris, please, thank you very much. Chris, great, welcome. Good morning. Who has Alexa at home? Hand up, please. We've got some good Alexa audience. Who has Google Home at home? Hands up. Excellent. Who doesn't like putting their hand up? Excellent. Right. Good audience. OK, so I'm just going to have a very short segue into something that's slightly less terrible and a little bit more touching you every single day. <laughs> this is real. This is a this is a, a thing you can buy in Japan right now. Dealing with a problem that's very common, which is young professional men working very long hours, living on their own, and getting very depressed. So this virtual assistant is out there in people's homes. Slightly scary. So our world isn't what we think it is today. Our world is far further down the line of computers dealing with what we used to do with ourselves every day, personalities, relationships, problem solving. But the real challenge that I come across every day is there are so many touch points into, into brands, into experiences. And, and amongst all of that, what, what's missing is what is the experience that your customer has with your brand and your business? And, and that touch point, the touch points of apps, of websites, of physical products are, are very quickly reducing down into a virtual assistant. <clears throat> and as a show of hands in the room, put, I reckon three quarters of the people in this room have a, a VA, a virtual assistant at home. I'm sure using it to different levels of of brilliance or frustration, but it's there, it's prevalent, it's on our phones. And the reason that voice is such an important part of all of our futures for our brands, for our businesses, for the way we think and way we work, is that it's just the obvious choice. If you have to type to ask a question, if you have to read text to get the answer, it's a massive cognitive load. But voice is just the first thing we do. We're born, we crawl, we learn to speak. We don't have to think about speaking, it just happens, like breathing. So to remove friction, to make our lives easier, virtual assistants are going to become de facto. So this is a study that was run on, on brain scan activity of literally typing and receiving information. So voice is 95% accurate at inputting a question. Text is about 85% to 90% accurate. So voice is now more accurate than typing. And if you think about your experiences on your phone, sending messages, actually, the amount of times you mistype and it has to auto-correct you, well, it's a, literally a no-brainer. Sorry, bad pun. Don't all laugh at once. So the big shift that's coming is, at the moment, the, the Google Home can do some cool stuff. I can ask Siti to transfer money to my friend Bobby, and it'll transfer the money for me. I don't have to log on, I don't have to type, I don't have to do anything. Done. Easy. A couple of years ago, transferring money in a bank was a nightmare. You know, five years ago, you had to go to the bank. Two years ago, even today, trying to use your apps to do things and authenticate, and it's very painful. 
booking a cab. I didn't look at my phone to book a cab. I just asked Google Home to book me a cab to go down to Brooklyn. That's fantastic. Why not? Just like asking in the old days, turn up to the cab rank and book it. And actually, when it works, the majority of people, 87% of regular voice users, say it makes their lives much easier. Not, I kind of like it, it's all right, but actually, when it works, it's brilliant. This is it. There is nothing else for me. But the key is, where is your brand's voice in this new world? How are people, how are your customers going to experience your brand? Like the MBA, the MBA flash briefings, perfect. I'm like, Alexa, I can find out what's going on with my team, I can find out what's going on in the league. But the MBA don't own that brand voice, they own the content. And so the tone of voice literally becomes the experience in the future. How is City going to talk to me? Does it have an authoritative voice? Is it a male? Is it a female? Is it English? Is it American? I don't know. And those are decisions we're going to have to make very quickly as brands, because that's literally going to be the only experience I as a customer have with you. And I was at a conference recently where Google were talking, and I asked them about Alexa and Amazon Prime and Amazon Fresh starting to disintermediate the brand experience. So at the moment, I can go out into my kitchen and I say, Alexa, order me some toothpaste. And Alexa orders my toothpaste. The last one I had, Colgate. What I'll start doing is saying, you, you have Colgate normally, but Amazon have a great toothpaste that scores better than Colgate with our customers, and it's half the price. Would you like that? Of course. Who doesn't want half price toothpaste? The next time I ask Alexa to order me toothpaste, it orders me Amazon's toothpaste. And I now no longer have a brand relationship with Colgate. And it'll do it for everything. Your life will change. Your products will be given to you without your choice. And it's a huge challenge for brands. So brands being able to own that space. And Google's argument is Google Home is all, and Google Assistant is all about giving a brand experience for lots of brands because that's their money. They make money from marketing product and brand experience. Amazon just want to own it all. They just want to be the de facto business selling their product to you. So I think it's a really important part that we all need to start thinking about and looking and experimenting with. How does voice work in our business? What's that interface? How do I establish myself in people's homes, in people's cars, in people's phones, and be the new brand? And the really, really scary fact is that within the next 10 years, everything will be AI first. So everything we do, where we come from a mobile first world, where still some businesses like a bank I happen to have to use doesn't have a mobile experience, which I find quite bizarre. It's AI now. Everything we need to be thinking about is how does AI influence my business, my customer experience, my brand, and my product. And voice is the layer on top of AI that we will all be interacting with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. So um, in today's world, it is not enough for organizations to focus on their consumers. It is equally or more important to take care of their internal users and employees. AI can be used to boost the organizational behavior and on our Future of Organizations studio, we specialize in helping companies bring their teams together. So Gibert, my partner and co-founder of the company, CTO of the company, will share with us how we can tap into the organization intelligence. Thank you, Gibert. Thank you. Big round of applause for welcoming Gibert. Thank you very much for being here today. How of a privilege it is to be a co-founder, to be starting something new. For those of us who have started a company, we feel that sense of belonging, that excitement, that ability to share dreams, to share values. First times in which we know all our people, in which we know their names, we know their family, we can relate to them. And then we start to grow. And that's, for those who have been there, you know, you feel the exhilarating power of growing. You grow into many places, into more and more people, and everyone is filled by that growth. And then, 
suddenly you are on an elevator and you have seen, you, you, you are feeling that something started to change. You don't know the, the name of the people you have in front of you, but suddenly they know you. You are the founder. So somehow we start to, to think on how can we overcome our human limitations to actually regain that. Because it's extremely important as a company to create that sense of, uh, of belonging and those shared values. There will be people coming over to your company one day, coming from different companies, and as culture is a game of imitation, it's extremely important to understand what happens. And that was what's happening to us, by, by the way. In the last 14 years, Globan became one of the fastest growing startups all around the globe. And that, for us, meant a challenge. So we started to think about that. And, you know, and we started to think on all the different organizational problems that we have. As you grow, hierarchies, risk aversion, silos, fears start to be in the middle, preventing the organization to grow as healthy as it was when it was a startup. So how do we augment that collective intelligence of our organizations? How do we become smarter? Actually, we can all realize that our life has, is, has been increasingly getting smarter and smarter by the addition of the mobile phone, as Martin was explaining. So collectively, as an organization, we still haven't done such a leap. Our bank, our telco, our airline, they all have cracks in which we, me, we stop thinking that we are a human, you know, where the human touch is lost. How do we overcome that? And that's what we wanted to do. So in the, when we were very young, um, we started to think about this. And I believe, actually, that that has been key for us to grow in a way we did. Globant is still a startup, but it's a massive scale startup where we are executing thousands of projects every year that are actually like startups within our company. So how do we do that? And I believe that one of the, 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 the reasons is that not only because we are a company that creates great technology, but because we have created great technology that makes us be who we are. So very early in our history, we conducted an experiment. We decided that we wanted to, you know, since we were not going to be able to be everywhere and we wouldn't be able to know everyone's name, we wanted to democratize the ability to, for our people to act as a guardian of the culture of our organization. Because actually they are co-founders of our company. So what you're seeing now on the screen is actually around more than 6,000 pictures of our own people, real people. Imagine the challenge we have in front of us. So we designed an experiment and we gave every employee the ability to recognize one another by using a virtual currency, what we call STAR. Essentially, every time somebody was seeing another person becoming a testament of these values, he would recognize them. Not only he would be elevating their peers, they would also start to elevate them, to, to, to be elevated. And what we found was amazing, was the, the thing that we could actually tap into the same addiction that we have every day with social media and with the eagerness to create a reputation for ourselves, that we could, for the first time, start to use that on the enterprise. While we did this, people started to use it. 
you know, for leaders as, of organizations in a moment that organizations, the vast majority of organizations must change, affecting change is extremely hard. But this was something that they wanted to do. That's how we started to get some people back into focus. That's how I started to know many people that otherwise I wouldn't have known. Like, for example, Agustin. Agustin, technically speaking, is a quality control analyst. But for me, he's the spark. Wherever you put Agustin, he will start a revolution. Uh, promoting values around himself. And actually, he became key to actually help us integrate our Indy operation where we are growing. It's far away. We needed to transport our culture there. That's how I also get to know Lina. You know, Lina is an amazing woman in India. She's like the mother of all. You know, she's always caring about us. And now I know her because of this technology. And I also get to know Justo, perhaps the most well-rounded of all our Globers. I'm very happy to see that when the president, he comes from a city in the northern part of Argentina, when the president came to Globant, he was able to speak about himself. And I felt really happy because of that. I like him, to, I, I believe that he's like a Friday night because everyone loves Friday's nights, isn't it? So we are, now, through technology, helping our people feel part of something and not being invisible. Uh, but at the same time, this enormous amount of information started for the first time to unveil a number of things for which today organizations don't have systems of records. We have transactional systems. Actually, companies have become extremely transactional and cold. We have communication systems, Slack, Gmail, chats, intranets. But we don't have systems for this until now. So the organizational problems don't end up here. If you think about, you know, we see a lot of things of misbehaviors. And what we do, we want to do at Globant is to actually help our companies hack into all these misbehaviors and through the use of technology be able to overcome them. And why do we believe this is important? Because when we talk about a digital transformation, and you will, I hope you, 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 you believe me because I'm a technologist. I believe that the, this transformation is, among other, other things, other but, but digital. You know, it is digital in some, po in some part because we need to react to the pressures of a digital-enabled com uh, competitor. And it will surely have to end up with us embracing technology to connect emotionally with our consumers. But in the essence, at the core, is a complete rewiring of our organization, starting with culture, with methodology. How do we focus on our people obsessively so we can serve them better? It's, of course, a technology game because we need to pave the way to go faster, frequently, cheaper to the market and embrace technology. And of course, it's a talent challenge because the vast majority of the things that we are talking today fall outside of the capabilities of the people we currently have in the vast majority of our organizations. So I believe we need to sort uh, what we do. It is a shame and should be a shame for most leaders to know that in the world we live on, all the advantages, the talent, the capital, the experience that we have is a disadvantage in comparison with a startup, with an entrepreneur that doesn't have anything. The only reason for that is that we haven't been able to do that. So this information started to help us unveil a lot of different things that we needed to know. So for instance, Right now, we are able to map out what's the relationship between our offices. You know, in a company like ours that is growing fast, we are in 14 countries. You know, we're getting to know how people connect to one another, how a division connects with another is extremely important. In this ocean of valuable data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, 
has enabled us to understand the di social dynamics that happen every day at work that we didn't know. So Toro, I, I know him by his name because even though he's far away from me, I know him personally, also known as Ezequiel Aguirre, the official name. He, every time he sends a star, he's starting an epidemic of well-being at Globant. So now we are understanding the social networks that happen between all of us that until now were invisible. So we also started to see in real time how love is being spread around our organization. So we can start to see that we are part of a larger organization one in which, despite the fact that we may be surrounded by these walls, you know, we are part of something larger. So at Future of Organizations, we've been working to make this available for other organizations that we believe it could be extremely useful. So today I would like to introduce you to Start Me Up OS. It's essentially an operating system for the organization of the future. It's a collective set of tools that will enable us to actually have an organization that is far more transparent, more real time, uh, where we can feel part of what we are building. So between this suite, we have a number of different solutions. I spoke briefly about Start Me Up and how we use that to recognize values. So we are able to send uh, every, in any given day, we are seeing hundreds of stars being sent from one people to another. We are able to celebrate it at every morning and browsing these celebrations and liking other people's things. So better me, we are allowing people to actually uh, be part of, uh, to give feedback and to help them grow. So be there, we are able to, it's, an, it's like an Instagram for a, an organization. It allows us to break down silos and geographies and feel part of an organization when a, a lot of different things happen. And this is just the beginning. We are doing quite a lot of work here uh, on getting to, to, to people to participate. For example, take part allow us, it's like a tinder for suggestions that allows people to engage and to become entrepreneurs, to move from being complaining into getting into the action. So I'm very excited about this and I'm very happy to, to see that through Start Me Up, we are making the invisible visible. Thank you.